So this week we'll be reading from Acts 4. Um, as always, we encourage you to have the word in front of you so you can follow along with us. So Acts 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognised that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign had been has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them, because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Now pass over to Beck. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to, to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him 
and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Thanks, guys. Well, let's pray, and then we can talk through Acts chapter 4 together. Uh, dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the chance to, to open it, to dwell on it, um, to let the truths within it sink into our hearts. I pray that your spirit will uh, be present this morning, uh, that your spirit will reveal to us um, what you would have said and what where areas where we need to learn and grow and be reminded again about the goodness of your grace and the power of the gospel. And we pray this, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. Morning, everyone. Acts chapter 4. I appreciate, um, obviously, what Tobias has said, also the reminder about Acts 1.8, um, where there's that promise that you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Because I think that idea of God's power has been a theme which has resonated through much of the first chapters of the book of Acts. You know, we saw that power in Acts chapter 2, and God put his power on full display when the Holy Spirit indwelt the apostles and they began speaking in different languages and people's lives began to be transformed by the gospel. And we saw God's power on display in a different way in Acts chapter 3 when there's this incredible healing of a man at the temple gates and that then sent shockwaves through the community in Jerusalem. And now in Acts chapter 4, God will continue to put his power on display through the early church in different ways yet again. One thing I think that's really revered and held up in today's society as well is power. We want to be powerful, or at the very least we want to be perceived to be powerful, because power sets us apart from the crowd. It, it makes us feel like a person of significance. So we see power displayed in all different ways in today's society. A person's power can be displayed through their authority when they have senior positions in workplaces or in other leadership positions within governments or other decision-making authorities. Seeing power displayed through a person's wealth or assets or influence. You know, a person like Elon Musk only needs to wake up tweeting that he sounds a bit grumpy and then all of a sudden the share market just tumbles. A person's power can be displayed in the way I do through my physical strength. Sheer brutality. <laughs> a person's power can be displayed through their intellect, when their amazing knowledge and, and creative abilities can have a sense of superiority in their field. Each of these displays of power set a person apart. They create the impression that they're a person of significance. But what we've begun to see in the early chapters of Acts and which is really clear in today's passage in Acts chapter 4, is that the power of man is nothing compared to the power of God. And the way God displays his power is so completely different to the way God displays his power. It's not through earthly wealth. It's not through physical strength. It's not through any perceived intellect or, or human-given authority. It's through ordinary, common people who are faithfully on mission for Jesus Christ. So as we look at Acts chapter 4 this morning, we're going to see three clear ways that God displays his power through Peter and John initially and through the wider community of believers which they are a part of. And my prayer is that by seeing and learning about how God displays his power through the early church, we might be challenged to consider how God might want to work powerfully through us here today as well. So let's have a look at Acts chapter 4 together and these three ways that God displays his power in this passage. Now the first way we see God displaying his power in Acts 4 is in the first section which Josh read out for, you, for us in verse 1 to 22 where we see Peter and John before the Sanhedrin. And here we see God's power displayed through the boldness of Peter and John as they declare the good news of Jesus. His power is displayed through the boldness of Peter and John as they declare the good news of Jesus. Now, Acts 4 is essentially the sequel to a scene that started in Acts chapter 3. As I've mentioned, God's power was put on display through the healing of a crippled man 
man who was lame, he couldn't walk from birth, and so he was in the routine of being carried to the temple gates so that he could beg for money from people who were going into the temple in order to pray or offer sacrifices. Peter and John look straight at him, they engage with him, they say, money is not what I can offer you, but I can offer you what you really need. That is salvation and healing in the name of Jesus. And instantly he's healed, he, he's helped to his feet, and he starts his celebratory lap around the temple. And we're told in Acts 3 verse 10 that all who witnessed this miracle were filled with wonder and amazement. Peter then declares in front of everyone that this healing through, was through Jesus, who they crucified, but who nevertheless has been raised by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so at the start of Acts chapter 4, we are right back in that moment. That is the scene that we enter back into. And I know it was read out before, but I might just read again the first four verses of Acts chapter 4, because I think it just creates good context for us and reminds us of the scene that we're in at this, at this point in time. It says, the priest and the captain of the guard, I'm actually reading from the NIV, the priest and the captain of the, guard, of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. It's right in that moment the religious authorities arrive. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day, and many who heard the message believed. So the number of men grew to about 5,000. So the religious authorities enter into the scene in the midst of this commotion that had clearly been created by this incredible healing of the lame man. And they hear Peter and John boldly speaking and attributing this healing to Jesus Christ. So they take them into custody, they put them into um, confines in jail so they could then interrogate them within the confines of the Sanhedrin the following day. But don't lose sight of verse 4 in this section. It's a really important verse. For it tells us that Peter and John may be arrested and thrown into jail, but the number of believers continue to grow. It grows to about 5,000. It's a great reminder that, that Peter and John could be imprisoned, but the message of the gospel could not. The spread of the gospel has never been dependent and will never be dependent on one or two individuals. God is the one who will build his church. His word will continue to go out. His Holy Spirit will continue to convict and God will continue to draw people to himself through faith in Jesus Christ. You know, we can sometimes feel like people's salvation rests on our shoulders as though its success hinges on our performance or our choice of words. But salvation has always been and will continue to be the work of God. Peter and John may be imprisoned, but the good news of Jesus is continuing to spread. Now that being said, there's nothing in Acts 4 which indicates that we should therefore just be passive bystanders when it comes to the good news of Jesus Christ. For what we instead see in verse 5 to 22 is that God nevertheless desires to use those who are willing to boldly declare the good news of Jesus to be part of his kingdom work and making his salvation known. So let's move on to these verses as we see what happens when Peter and John appear before the Sanhedrin. Now, first of all, I want us again to try and picture this scene. The Sanhedrin was like the Jewish high court, up to 71 members. We're told there were priests or rulers present. There are um, elders which are there. There are other lay teachers of the law. And more specifically, Luke names a few prominent individuals who are there. Annas, who was there, who was actually the former high priest who was deposed by the Romans in AD 15. But Luke here refers to him as the high priest as a mark of his continuing influence and significance. Caiaphas is his son-in-law. He the, was the official high priest from AD 18 to 36. And there's other members of the high priest's family who are there. 
So this was a significant meeting involving a lot of people and extremely influential individuals, all gathering to cross-examine Peter and John about the events that had just occurred. I'm not sure if you've ever been in court before. I still remember the first time I did as a young up-and-coming lawyer. It's an extremely nerve-wracking experience. You stand before this intimidating judge who has his lofty, elevated position so he can suitably look down on you from above. There's security guards and authorities around which scan you on the way in and watch over your every move. There's a process and a formality that can seem quite overwhelming. And I remember waiting for my turn to speak, sweating through my shirt, continually thinking how I was going to, continually forgetting how I was going to start and those amazing opening words that I had planned a thousand times. And all I was trying to do was get this disadvantaged individual an exemption from having to pay infringements that he was never going to be able to pay. It was still a terrifying experience. Well, here is Peter and John, right? They're not lawyers. They're not trained orators. They are not well-educated. And here they are standing in front of a 71-member Sanhedrin with incredibly influential individuals. I wonder how you would go in that moment. Well, let's see how Peter and John go. The question the Sanhedrin put to Peter and John is a straightforward one. But it goes to the core of why they were standing before them in custody. You see it in verse 7. By what power or what name do you do this? Referring back to the healing miracle that, they, that had been witnessed at the temple gates. They want to know in whose power and in whose name did this occur. Couldn't it be man's power because he'd been crippled from birth? Man would have done it by now. This is some other power. So in the face of this packed Sanhedrin, let's see how Peter responds in verses 8 to 12. First it says, and this is really important, it says, filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. In Peter's own strength, this would have been a terrifying and overwhelming scene. And we've seen Peter's natural response to those settings in what Alan shared in the communion focus, right? He denied Jesus continually when he was placed under pressure in the events that led up to the crucifixion. But this moment is different. In this moment, the Holy Spirit is at work empowering and strengthening Peter with a boldness that would otherwise not have been found in and of himself. You can already see God working through the Holy Spirit to display his power once again through the boldness of Peter and John in this moment. And this boldness is immediately evident in the way Peter responds to their question. He clearly declares that this man had been healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the one whom they had crucified, but the one whom God raised from the dead. And he quotes Psalm 118 verse 22. The stone you builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And in doing so, he gives this psalm a messianic context, which he is saying is being fulfilled through their rejection of Jesus Christ and the way God has now glorified him as the cornerstone of their salvation. And Peter finishes with this amazing summary verse in verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else. Now, I want those words to just resonate in our hearts this morning. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. I think you'll agree that today's world looks for salvation in a lot of different places. It looks for salvation in our morality and our ethics, thinking, well, if I live a good overall life, then I'll be fine. It looks for salvation in our success thinking if we achieve enough accomplishments, then surely I'll be fine. It looks for salvation in others, thinking if we do good and look after other people, a good citizen, then I'll be fine. Or perhaps closer to home, it looks for salvation in our religious practices, thinking if I go to church and I pray and I do the right religious 
things, then I'll be fine. But that is not the gospel. The gospel says that salvation will only ever be found in Jesus Christ. For there is no other name by which we can be saved. In whose name or power did you do this? They asked Peter. And his response, by the name and power of Jesus, for there is no other name by which anyone can be saved. We can only declare the gospel when we know the gospel. Peter knew the truth of the good news of Jesus, that he was the son of God who was crucified for our sins, but was raised again by the creator God so that through faith, in him we might be saved. Peter had experienced his own failure. He had experienced the hurt of his own sin, but he'd also experienced the grace of God and he knew that his salvation was only by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because he knew it, the Holy Spirit empowered him to boldly declare it. So my question for you and for us is, Do we know the gospel? Do we really know it? Not in your head. Do we know it in our hearts? That Jesus is our only hope and that there is no point in turning towards or pursuing anything other than him. Because God wants to use you for his kingdom work in powerful ways, but he wants you to know him first. And to know the salvation that can only be found in him. Well, Peter and John knew the good news of Jesus and God empowered them to declare it in front of the Sanhedrin. And we see the outworking of that in the following verses. In verse 13 to 22, we see that Peter and John are actually released from the Sanhedrin. So let's look at verse 13 together. It says, when they saw the courage or boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. So often we let our feelings of inadequacy hold us back from sharing about the good news of Jesus. When we feel like uneducated, ordinary people, we can use it as an excuse for thinking, therefore, God can't or won't use us. But here we can see that the ordinariness of Peter and John is exactly what God used because it made it clear that their boldness and their strength and their courage was not of themselves, but it was of God. Reminds me of 1 Corinthians 1, verse 27 to 29, where it says this, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast in him. Feelings of inadequacy are actually a blessing because they remind us of the sufficiency of Christ and that our power ultimately rests in him. So in verse 14 to 17, the Sanhedrin send them away because they need a moment to regroup after all this. And they recognize that they can't deny the miracles happen because all these people have seen it. They can't really punish him, these people, for healing a lame man. So all they can really do is send them away with a stern warning not to continue speaking and teaching of Jesus. And Peter and John reply in verse 19 to 20 says, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him, you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. I feel we have a tendency to look for reasons why we can stop speaking about what we have seen or heard, rather than being compelled to speak about what we have seen or heard. We can be held back by our ordinariness or, our co- or the cost or the potential reaction or the opposition. But if we know the gospel to be true, 
And if we experience the grace of God for ourselves, then how can we help but speak about the good news of Jesus, the only name by which us or anyone else can be saved? In verse 1 to 22, we see that God works powerfully through believers as they boldly declare the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? That he works powerfully through believers when they boldly declare the good news of Jesus Christ. Rather than letting us things hold us back from sharing about what we've seen and declare to be true, let's pray that as a church God would grant us the boldness to declare the wonders of his grace and his salvation and to make Jesus known and that the truths of the gospel would therefore sink down into our hearts so that we can't help but speak about the salvation that is ours in Jesus. So let's recap for a moment, okay? We've seen God's power displayed through the boldness of believers. Now in the next section in verse 23 to 31, we see God's power displayed through the prayers of believers. After being released in the Sanhedrin, Peter and John then head back to their wider community of believers and they report everything that had been said to them by the, by the Sanhedrin. No doubt, the, in particular, the warning not to speak about and teach about Jesus anymore. And the response of the people in that moment when they report back to them is an amazing example to us. Because they don't panic, do they? They don't get angry or frustrated at God. They don't blame him for what's gone on. They don't seem to be consumed with worry or concern. They simply pray. But it's not the fact that they immediately turn to prayer that is particularly impressive. It's also what they pray. First, they acknowledge the sovereignty of God over all things. And you can see this in verse 24 from the first two words of the prayer. It says, Sovereign Lord. And you see that theme of sovereignty echo through this prayer as it continues with a reference to God's creative power and authority in verse 24. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You see it by the prophetic words of David in Psalm 2, which are quoted in verse 25 and 26, as a foretelling of the rejection of Jesus Christ. And the way that rejection was effectively fulfilled by the way people conspired against him in the lead up to his crucifixion. But in all those things, they are described as being under the power and will of God. He was in control of those moments too. The early church knew that God was sovereign over all things, even the inevitable opposition to the gospel. And so nothing was therefore outside of that power, authority, and control. And they prayed it to God as an act of worship, but also as a way, I think, of reminding themselves of these truths again and again. And only then, having acknowledged and reminded themselves of who God is, do they then turn to their requests. In verse 29 and 30, but their requests weren't that God would take the opposition away. And their requests aren't that they would make their life any easier for them. Their requests were that God would enable them to speak with great boldness and that God would perform signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. They prayed for boldness in their witness and they prayed that God's power would continue to be made known. I wonder how the prayer of the early church in those verses compares with our own prayer life. When I ask our kids to pray at night, I'm always interested in what I get back. Dear God, pray for running club tomorrow. That you help me get out of bed, even though it's really cold, my feet get wet when I run. Dear God, I pray that we'll be able to watch Octonauts tomorrow, because Dad turned it off early tonight. It's a common one. Dear God, pray that we might have a special breakfast tomorrow, because we've been eating porridge for a few weeks now. Now, I know that kids will be kids, right? I get that. But I get convicted when I hear it because they also not only reflect my average parenting, but they <laughs> imitate what they see modelled to them. And I think it's often a reflection of the prayer life they see demonstrated in me 
one that's focused on myself and my issues and my shopping list of requests for the coming days and weeks, rather than on the power and holiness and sovereignty of our great God and, our, and, our, and the call to make his name and salvation known. How much do we pray for that? When we see that in the prayers of the early church, look what happens in verse 31. After they prayed, the place they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They prayed and God answered with power because they didn't pray for themselves. They recognized who God was and his sovereign control and they prayed that the gospel would be made known with power and with boldness, both in what they said and in what God did. And when we pray that kind of prayer, prayers that are focused on him and his kingdom rather than ourselves, prayers that magnify who God is and desire that his glory would be made known, then God will use those prayers with power. Do you believe that? God will work through those prayers in powerful ways. He works powerfully through believers as they boldly declare the good news of Christ. And he works powerfully through the prayers of believers when they recognize who he is and desire that his glory would be made known. Then in these last verses, in verse 32 to 37, we see the final way God displays his power, and it's through the lives of believers. This section effectively starts with an overarching summary, sen summary sentence in verse 32. It says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. This group of believers stood out because of their unity in Christ. They stood and they served as one without conflict, without factions, without agendas, without allegiances. And you see, the more we unite around the gospel and the more we unite around Jesus Christ, the more we unite together as a body of believers. But their unity also expressed itself in very practical ways. They shared all they had. That says they didn't claim it to be their own. And from time to time, they sold their assets in order to look after the needy that was among them. The unity of the believers was then expressed itself through a sacrificial generosity. And Barnabas is given as an example of someone who demonstrated this incredible generosity, an example that will be contrasted heavily in chapter 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. Now, we love to be generous, don't we? And that's not a sarcastic comment. I think we genuinely do love to be generous. It feels good to donate to a good cause, to support others in their ministry work, or you know, to provide some practical assistance or support for people who need it. And I genuinely do believe this is a very generous church. I've been overwhelmed at times by the extent of people's generosity within this congregation. But I equally think that you will all relate to that part of human nature that enjoys generosity to the extent it is comfortable. To the extent we have enough left in reserve for us. To the extent it doesn't compromise on our own security or position. To the extent our generosity feels safe and manageable. Comfortable. That's human nature, isn't it? We often give and we demonstrate generosity to the extent it's comfortable. But the challenge for me as I reflected on verse 32 to 37 is that the picture of generosity I see in these verses is not a comfortable generosity. It is a sacrificial generosity. It comes at a personal cost. It's people elevating the needs of others way above their own. It flows from a place of being one in heart and mind. But we need to remember that we will never be sacrificially generous by simply trying to make ourselves more generous. 
We will never be perfectly united by simply trying to make ourselves more united. We only live these kinds of lives when we fix our eyes firmly on the cross of Christ and remind ourselves daily of his limitless love and generosity towards us that has been shown by Jesus, the one who gave up his very life and laid it at the Father's feet, the one who demonstrated that no cost was too great for God's saving work, the one who held back nothing from us so that we would hold back nothing from him. So when he calls us to take up the cross and follow him, it's not a call to partial unity. And it's not a call to comfortable generosity. It's a call to complete unity and sacrificial generosity through the power of his Holy Spirit as it goes to work in our hearts as we draw ourselves deeply down into the truths of the gospel and we let God start to go to work on us. And as the early church was united around Christ and followed his example of sacrificial generosity, we read in verse 33, with great power, see that word again? With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and grace was so powerfully at work in them that there was no needy person among them. See how God's at work with power? Because of the fruit of their unity and generosity. It's one thing for people to hear the message spoken. It is an entirely different thing when they see it lived. When they see it at work with their own eyes, then they can't deny it. When they see it lived, God will work in the hearts of those around us with power. So we're reminded here that God works powerfully through the lives of believers as they unite together around Jesus Christ. Three ways God displays his power. He displays it through the boldness of believers as they declare the good news of Jesus. He displays it, he displays it through the prayers of believers as they recognize who he is and desire that his glory would be made known and he displays it through the lives of believers as they unite together around Jesus Christ may we collectively as a church and also as individuals be less and less focused on our own power or strength or lack thereof and more and more focused on God and how he can display his power and strength through us as we live faithful lives on mission for Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you are a great God who is powerful over all things. Lord, we praise you for the way you choose to make your power known through ordinary common people who are on mission for Jesus. Lord, may you work in our hearts so that we would be willing to boldly declare the good news of Jesus, that our prayers would be prayers about you and not about us, that our prayers would be kingdom prayers, that pray that your kingdom would come and that your work would be done. Lord, may your Holy Spirit work in our lives that we would be a united people who demonstrate the sacrificial generosity that was modelled through your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the way you're at work. We thank you that you are building your church and that you choose to use us as part of your salvation plan. We praise you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.